Thanks. So uh, we've kind of, we're trying to be careful in, in how we submit the final thing to them so they won't damage us too badly. Also, the Columbia film now, so maybe they won't hit us so hard, but you never can tell. Like, uh, you know, Chainsaw went in, and uh, I think they were waiting for you guys for that. So I think they decide we're not going to like this film because it's Texas Chainsaw Massacre first. And I'm sure they're prejudiced about that. Whereas, what wasn't the like Dark Side? The anime. And you said they liked that film. So, you know, I mean, we keep talking to uh, these guys, especially if there was a big letter writing campaign or something, something that forced them to create a new rating, I think it would do us all some good. Not that we want children to go in and see stuff they shouldn't see. Uh, you know, I mean, if it's, if it's a speed for violence, I mean, I took my daughter, my daughter's five, but I took her to see Robocop, and uh, maybe because I wanted to see it, and I was babysitting that night, and no, and I wound up covering her eyes, but, you know, it was ridiculous, I mean, so blow my, you know, and there's a, there's a limit to what, I mean, she has a latitude to what she accepts because she's my daughter, but I still felt like covering her eyes. Uh, but, if, you know, but if I had a speed for violence, I think parents should be careful, but, uh, yeah, you go to a video store later. I'm going off on a tangent, I realize. But I think, yeah, to answer your question, there might be some problems with some stuff. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. <coughs> so differences between the remake and the original? If I did that, then what's the point of you going to see? <laughs> <laughs> no, I can tell you that there are. There's, wow. Well, I think, yeah, it's all right. So we thought about taking the finished film, and we still might do this and subtract the color from it, like in the beginning. Not make it black and white, but take the existing footage, subtract the color for the first, I don't know, four or five minutes for the credit sequence or stuff, and then start bringing the color in as it goes. So this way, when you first start watching it, visually it's going to be pretty similar. Uh, not a lot. I mean, there's going to be a lot of changes from the very first second of the film. But the attitude of the first film, I mean, I'm sure everyone has seen this film, and yeah. Uh, and I think when George wrote it, he wrote it with the idea that so many people are familiar with it, that you'll sit there and you'll start seeing familiar things and start to relax and, oh, a change will happen, or a weird difference will occur, or a character that's not quite the same will pop up. And that's where the scares will be. That's how I think he's able to manipulate you uh, into the scares of this film by making sure that you, by depending on your familiarity with the first film, you okay? So we, there's talk about uh, subtracting the colors so that when you first start seeing it, it won't be black and white, but it'll have that feeling of the old film. You know? And then as the story progresses, the color will start coming in and go along with the new, I wanted to say new story, but it's not, it's basically the same story, the same characters. Uh, I've tried to cast everybody as cool to look as close to their original characters as possible because I don't want to build a wall between you guys and the new people, you know. Uh, with the exception of Barbara, everybody is kind of close to the, to the first film. Um, but then, like I said, those twists and turns start to happen. And I hope what you'll think is, based on seeing the first film, well, is that going to happen the way it's did or not? And then that anxiety will be there. And if it does or it doesn't, hopefully that's where the scare will be. Yeah. Are you the guy that asked me that in the dealer's room? No, I did. Oh, you did? Okay, you sure do. Yeah, I, at New York, he was saying that I talked about having the zombie point of view to be black and white in the film. And I really was going to do that, but then uh, George got involved in the conversation, and he, he said something that was kind of true. If you start seeing zombie point of views in the film, that makes them kind of an entity that you're getting inside, you know what I'm saying? And that might, they, may not, they, they might not come across as the dead thing that we're trying to portray. It was a good point, so we abandoned that idea of black and white zombie point of views. So if you never get inside their heads and all you do is ever, you just see them, um, they will come across as this dead race. I also did a thing where um, you will hardly ever look into, a, I, I hope that you never see the zombie's eyes and there's life in there. Um, they, they, the main the zombies, and I'm calling them, I hate to use the zombie word because I don't think want to thank you for this. If I had my way, we would have taken we would have taken cadavers and mechanized them, you know. You can't do that, so you know. But that's the look, that's the look we want, mechanized cadaver. So the eyes are always covered by fake eyes, and either under the eyelids or looking that way, or there's shadows across them. So if our eyes are the windows to our souls, so I mean, zombies are supposed to be us without souls, hopefully that's the impression that you get by the time 
see that you're into the film, and that if you're not, that these are dead things. The zombie point of view is what it detracted from that, and again, that's why we didn't do it. Yeah. Somebody called, uh, he's asking me if, some, if uh, it's possible to do George's uh, original idea for data. There's a guy in England named Richard Driscoll who called oh, about six months ago, before we started Night of the Living Dead, and he discovered the original script to David. He got all excited, he wanted to back it, and he, uh, I turned him on to George, and uh, George wasn't crazy about that. He didn't know this guy. And, you know, he had lots of phone calls. It's hard to tell who's serious about things unless there's a check or there's a contract. Um, but he wanted to finance a, a remake of Day of the Dead, the original script. George wasn't interested, so the guy was asking George and myself if we had other projects that he might be uh, interested in doing. And I, I don't know what happened to him since then. Uh, George kind of passed the guy off as a weirdo. I don't know what happened since then. Except that this guy has now resurfaced about uh, uh, doing Telltale Tavern. Uh, um, there's a writer named John Esposito who wrote uh, uh, Graveyard Ship, the one I was supposed to direct a few years ago. Well, they are doing it right now, and some of the guys directing it. The guy who worked on, uh, the guy who produced the Biggie recently. You know who the guy is? Uh, 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 that was different. Some, they mentioned a different film. 48 Hours. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think he was a producer on it. But he's directing Graveyard Ship. But anyway, the, Esposito is, is now um, parent on Hot On yeah? And he presented Telltale's having this chance on be doing that with Greg and Gatero of K&B producing that. Uh, I'll find a way to get to direct help on parents. Also, Dario Argento called me recently and wants me to direct in Italy uh, an Edgar Allan Poe thing. So, this is what, luckily for me, what's happening is before the Night of the Living Dead is released, uh, I'm getting other offers. I'm going to grab the first one I can't because if Night of the Living Dead isn't a success, I'll never direct again. But if <laughs> I get one before it comes out in the bombs, well, I got another one. Right? How about this one? You know, so so I'm, I hope I'm lucky enough before October 19th when the film is released to, have, to be working on something else. Yeah. Uh, what was the original script like? The, uh, the, the, the oh, David said, well, shit, it was like Raiders of the Lost Ark of Zombies. It was incredible. Uh, they made it rewrite it five times uh, because the, the, they kept uh, the, tearing the budget down. So what you saw was what we ended up affording to do. You know, But there was so, oh, God, there was so much stuff in there. Uh, I can't really get as specific as that. I don't remember because we cut it, we dwelled on what we were supposed to do. I'm still in the dark here. I hate it if I were looking at somebody who was in the dark. Yeah. Uh, what's the status of uh, Heartstopper and Two Evil Eyes right now as far as the release date? Two Evil Eyes. Dario Argento is in New York right now talking to American distributors on that. Uh, Actually, I don't it's, know. Co it's coming out in October from Taurus Entertainment. Uh, for theaters? Yeah, theaters. Great. Well, Heartstopper, I don't think Heartstopper will ever see the light of a projector. Yeah. Like it's, uh, it's it's just bad. <laughs> 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 Too bad. I mean, uh, Moon's after me, uh, Michael J. Pollard. There's some great moments in it. I think they just made big editing mistakes. Uh, uh, I think it's all it's sold all over Europe now. Uh, I don't know if you're going to see a video release on that. Probably will. Uh, well, Jack Russo's connection with some of our video. Uh, I just hope it's not going to be another ripper. <laughs> Do I have to apologize for that again? Or do you, my, my apology is still holding on that? Who said yes? <laughs> okay, I'll get out of my knees with one guy. Yeah. yeah. What about your Grand Illusions 2 book? Yeah, what about that? <laughs> I'm too busy, you know. No, I, I, I think, I don't know, I was in Boston three years ago, I think, and uh, I think I said at that time that uh, I, I gave them three chapters. And they still have those three chapters, and I just haven't had the time to write any more. I'm crazy about doing it. I mean, I've got so much stuff. If we were to do it, it would be twice as thick. You know, there's, so, there's so many films there. And if I never do special makeup effects again, it's just going to be a nice, uh, uh, a fitting end, a fitting document of when I was doing that. You know what I'm saying? So I'm really anxious to do it. Um, if the movie does well, and um, I, you know, I had to become a member of the DGA, the Director's Guild, to do the film. I didn't know this. Uh, the producer told me. Uh, halfway through the film, that when you're a member of the DGA, automatically you get five and a half percent of profits. I didn't know this. Uh, so I have five and a half percent of the profits on it, not really with that. Plus, I have another deal with George's company for profit. So if that comes to I may just finance the book myself because I, I do want to do it that bad. If so, then you'll see it. Uh, uh, anyway, yeah.
Yeah, that's where that is. Yeah. I was. It was a big one. My name and how she was great. Stoop down to what? Makeup effects? <laughs> I don't think it's step down. I, I really missed it. I really. I can't tell you the the the, uh, the, uh, the split I was experiencing. I mean, here's a you know effects being created before my eyes, and my hands weren't in it. And you know, of course, I suggested and designed some of it, but uh, I no longer hung up with the effects guy. No, I'm, it was hell. There were days when directing was a hellish nightmare that I just wanted to be uh, uh, saved from. And there were days when it was just heaven, paradise, things were going so well. But it was like, uh, imagine being asked uh, 25 questions in 25 seconds, okay? Questions that involved the, the end, the beginning, the, the middle, and things that you had to make a decision on then, or, or it wouldn't happen, you know? Um, for 18 hours a day, you know? And then trying to get the performances out of the actors. Uh, um, I asked for it, I got it, you know, so I had to put my money where my mouth is, and, uh, but I'm sorry, did I answer you? If I was comfortable, well, I stooped down to make an effect. Again, I don't think it's a step up. For me, it would be a, it would be a step up, because going from what I had to deal with mentally to just doing the makeup effects, man, it really made me appreciate what the makeup guys go through and what I used to put into it, you know, when I was but to me, it's a step up. It would be, be a relaxing step up. Yeah, way back there. Well, wait, I'm thinking something new. I'll get you in a second. Yeah. Well, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm still, uh, I'm still sculpting this bust of my dad that I've been doing for three years. You know, it's like, uh, here comes another Christmas this year, and I, it won't be done for that, uh, for that either. I've been involved, I've been doing a lot of oil painting just to keep my, uh, like I'm working, I was working with the storyboard artist. Remember that we had 700 storyboards. The whole movie was, in fact, storyboard. You know. uh, but that took a lot of time, and to relax from that, to, to relax from the everyday pressure of the pre-production, I would uh, do a little more sculpting on my dad, do some oil painting or something. But uh, um, I haven't, I haven't stuck glue on a person's face for maybe uh, a year and a half now. Yeah, I thought I saw, yeah. You consider doing some cameos from the actors from the first night of Living Dead movie? Yeah, in fact, there is one. You have to look for it, though. Um, some the act, okay. The actors, I would say, most of the actors from well, Dwayne Jones is dead. You know that. Yeah. Um, Judy O'Dell, I don't, I don't know where she is, but everybody else uh, was on the set at one time or another uh, to meet their <laughs> modern counterparts. You know, the, the people in the new film. Um, one guy, the, 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 well, if I tell you who's not in it, it'll give away something. I don't want to do that. There was one guy who really wanted to be in it from the first film. And I said, fine. I even cast him as a, as a, as a really uh, special zombie. But then I heard from uh, George Romero and other producers, they gave me a definite no on this person. And uh, I said, well, why? He said, well, this guy went out and did another movie. Uh, that George felt was a ripoff of Night of the Living Dead. And the guy gave me the finished film, and we sat around and watched it. This is the guy who gave me the film to show George that it was not a ripoff. And second by second, it was a blatant ripoff. The film, blatant. I mean, even on the rewrite, it was like he saw George's new script. It included stuff in that film. So, well, that makes me name, so George is going to be a flat out no on that guy, so he's not in it. But there is one guy, um, you have to, you have to fuck. I don't want to tell you. Thank you, look for it. No, no, I, I did say that, didn't I? That's right. <laughs> but now it's easier to figure out. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, which movie most reached my expectations as far as... Uh, well, with the exception of Night of the Living Dead, it would have to be a movie that I did make up effects on. Right? Um, no, well, not really. I expected that to be shorter and uh, more action-packed and less homosexual references, you know. Uh, I like to see the movie if we edit it someday to about an hour and a half. Uh, I think it could still... Somebody asked me about this earlier. Most people either love that movie or hate that movie. Um, I have no idea how I feel. I love watching it when I watch it because I know everybody and I like the music. I like 
the boo would behind it, but uh, commercially, I you know, I think it needs uh, a lot of help. Uh, it needs to be shorter. But may, I, what Dana Dent, um, Dana Dent, I think uh, was Dana Dent operated? Yes. yes. Yeah. So everything was in it. I guess I have to say that that one, and uh, um, I was surprised that monkey shines. I had. I didn't think the concept of a little monkey would be scary. For the last half hour, that's pretty intense. Um, Evil eyes, it's hard to say on that one. Yeah, I like that one a lot. Uh, you know, I think he did a great thing with the effects. He made them real quick. He didn't really watch for them. So the death of Jason, he was able to leave it longer. That worked. Uh, maniac. You know, I was surprised they got away with Maniac. Uh, anybody see Maniac 2? I haven't seen that yet. Oh, it's not out yet. I'm thinking of Maniac Cop. Same director, same guy. But I understand that Joe Spinell was directing Maniac 2 before he died? You know, he died. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, you know, what? He only directed part of it. Part of it. So he died in the middle of it, or somewhere in there. Do you know who took over? Yeah, I don't know. No, those. Um, I'm still in the shadows of the because I can see you. See, can't they find? Well, you're right there. <laughs> um, the in the first film, Night of the Living Dead, the uh, the, the Helen character, right, the daughter in the basement. Uh, remember the uh, in in the remake is is played by McKee Anderson. Who said he went over there with a white shirt on? I told her I'd embarrass her by saying that. She's playing Helen in the in the, uh, in the remake. Um, anybody else? Way back there. Yeah. Back at the New York convention, you talked about maybe getting Michael Ironside and Steve James. I know. You know when I, and I went after those guys. Uh, in fact, I talked to Steve a lot on the phone. And he told me that, uh, well, a number of things. Um, he was real hot on doing it. I mean, he was definitely, as far as I was concerned, was just getting a piece of paper in front of him to get him to sign it. Uh, George wasn't crazy about the idea, but he said, if you want him, go for him. But that's how nice George was about the whole experience. Whatever I wanted, even bad, even ideas that he thought were bad within what I was going to do, he said, I don't care about, I, my taste isn't in that area, but if you want to do that, go. He let me do everything I wanted to do. And even as far as me wanting to cast Steve James. His wife was worried that uh, Steve James has this kung fu kind of connotation to his person. And I, I didn't see that, because I haven't seen many of his kung fu films. But uh, anyway, his problem was that he has done so many low budget films and his, he was getting like 150000 for his next film. We were offering, offering scale. And his agent was really talking him out of it, you know. So we had to, I had to respect his feelings. We had open auditions. And a guy walked in from Platoon, this guy named Tony Todd from Platoon, and just blew us away. He was, uh, he walked in, he was, he was crying. I mean, he was just perfect. He was tall. To me, he looked uh, very similar to Dwayne Jones. And like I said, I really wanted to cast the people as close to the originals as possible. So I cast Tony Todd. And the guy that plays Harry, now Michael Ironside was in Canada doing some uh, TV series. So uh, some friends of mine turned me on to uh, Tom Cole, who played Otis and Henry, the portrait of the zoo over So he's Harry. He was wonderful. He was. <laughs> He was, he was a lot of fun to have around. He was always on. He was, uh, we were always looking for a kill switch on him because his mouth between takes. He, he disrupted the set often, often. After the first two days, we said, oh my God, well, you know, we've got six weeks of this guy. After those first two days, it became, oh, when's Tom coming? We couldn't wait for him. You know, it was a real treat to have him around. He was, we always loved him. Um, let's see, Barbara. Barbara is uh, Patty Coleman now. I cast her in one of my Dark Side episodes. You may have um, seen the family reunion episode of a loving year old werewolf. Anyway, it's Patty Coleman. Um, who else? Uh, well, you might have Sarah, the little girl, was this little 13 year old girl who could have played Judah, Barbara, Helen. She could have, she was wonderful. She could play any role. 13 years old, she was wonderful. Who else? Uh, who? Oh, yeah, Katie, a, 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 a local actress. From Carnegie Mellon University played Judy, uh, the young, the young girl, and the young guy is uh, Bill Butler, who was killed in Friday the Thirteenth Part. I don't know what. 
<laughs> so with Texas Chainsaw 3. He's got this reputation of being killed in like every horror movie he's in. So uh, uh, he sent me a tape. Uh, he sent me a tape of himself doing the part. And, it's, and I had other auditions for that part too, but uh, he not, nobody could compare to his tape that he sent me, so we cast him from L.A. Is that everybody? Ben, uh, uh, Barbara, Harry, uh, Alan, Sarah, Bill, Katie? Who? Johnny. Oh, Johnny. Oh, Johnny. Okay. Johnny was Bill Mosley, the guy who played Playhead in, uh, in Texas Chainsaw 2. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's killed. He would love him. He would love him. He's great. Uh, and he dies gloriously. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Something Lee Cordelli? Okay, what's your second question? Uh, no, there were many opportunities. My hair was down the year. I could have played the... Uh, yeah, you know, we talked before about how the movie, the, the original movie ends about, uh, I don't know, 60 minutes after the remake. And then it goes on, it continues on a little bit, you know? Um, there's a big fiasco at the end, we call it the, the zombie festival, where there's bikers and there's uh, all kinds of weirdos. And I was going to just pop in as one of those bikers, but... Uh, just never got around to doing it. And Chili Billy Cardilly, I was worried about casting him again in the remake because uh, he looks a lot different. He had a different toupee from his beard. I didn't think people would recognize him right off the bat. Also, I thought it would, uh, there's, not a, there's not a laugh in this movie. I mean, it, there's not an intentional laugh in the film. You might find things funny, but that's you, you're weird. <laughs> that's why we're here. We're all here. Uh, uh, I didn't want to do anything that would, that would hurt the integrity of the film or put a laugh in or uh, be schmaltzy. So I kind of opposed having Chili Billy Cardilly in it. But then George told me that uh, in Europe, when they see Night of the Dead, George gets mail uh, because of the end credits to say Chili Billy He says, well, who is this Chili Billy Cardilly? So he thought we should put him in. So we did get him in in a kind of a neat way, which you'll see. And it does involve an actor from the first film, so now you know. So if you see Chili Billy Cardelli, the guy, why don't I just tell you who the guy you know? I'll still give it up to you to look for this guy. Okay, yeah, but he is in it. Um, anybody else? Oh, please, I don't want to start tap dancing. Yeah. Does the movie take place in the 60s like the original? I'm sorry, what? Does the movie take place in the 60s like the original? Mm, that, no, it does not take place in the 60s, or it does take place in the 60s. No way. Uh, I wanted it to be periodless. So, I mean, I had scenes where you're driving on the highway to a cemetery, um, but then we were worried about seeing other cars, and the years of those cars would have been important. Also, if you saw other cars, you wouldn't get the sense that you're going into an isolated area, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, it's kind of periodless in that, um, since Night of the Living Dead, we've had Dawn of the Dead, we've had Day of the Dead, and, they pre and Night predates those things. So, we figured out that Dawn of the Dead took place in 79, so as long as we stayed around 77, you know, or 78, we're cool. So there's one thing that kind of dates it, and that's uh, there's a car, uh, the car that, she, that they drive to the cemetery in. And it's one of my old cars that I sold them on. And it's a 77, so that's kind of uh, sets it, like, in about that area. Because you really couldn't leap ahead of daily that it wouldn't be logical. Um, so uh, it takes some pain to do that. But it's definitely, definitely not uh, 60s. Or, again... While you're watching it, I hope the impression is that it's periodless, you know. Uh, the the, the t-shirts say, and the ads may say, I'm not sure, uh, Night of the Living Dead, 90, you know, but it really isn't 90, okay? Yeah, somebody over there? Yeah. You know, um, when George Romero was running the screen, what, did he have any problems making changes for the remake? Did he go about it grudgingly, having to rewrite it? When he wrote the screenplay, did he have, uh, you said problems working things out for the remake? You know, they're making a little changes that would make it different. Oh, no, I don't think there's any problems making changes because there's a lot of changes. I mean, there's a lot of twists and turns and lots of surprises. I, you know, we sat together at his house in Florida and talked about the remake a lot. We're trying to think of who to bring back, you know, from the, uh, to, to, to change the ending of the film. And the one thing I said was that uh, Barbara... You can bring Barbara back. He says, well, what do you think? He says, well, you know, we see the zombies drag her out, but we never see her killed. Everybody else is killed in the film. So that, that spurred some things that I don't want to give away that off-camera stuff. Um, one thing that I was conscious of is, uh, as far as women getting killed, um, it's 
mainly happens shadows against the wall or off camera. There are some pretty blatant women deaths in the film, but I wanted to make sure that I, did, that I don't get the flack that usually comes my way. Well, you know, in all your movies that you're just killing innocent women left and right in graphic ways, don't you like women? You know, well, that's of course. You know, <laughs> but I wanted to make sure that, that, that people, when they see this, see a conscious effort toward how women get it. Okay. <laughs> don't worry, there's a lot of men get it in juicy ways, too. <laughs> all right. Yeah. A guy named Frank Prinzi, he directed The Prince of Pennsylvania, did, a, did 30 weeks in a TV series called uh, Blue Steel, I think it is. Or was that a movie? No, Blue Steel was the Jamie Lee Curtis film. True Blue, True Blue that's it, yeah. Yeah, he did that one. Part? Let's try A feature film? Oh, because I thought The Prince was the only film in DP. Well, it's me one on the resume. So maybe you're not too crazy about that. Yeah, Frank Prinzi. Uh, and it's beautiful. The guy is a painter with light. It's huge. It's really great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, you know what you do? It's a funny thing. Uh, you know, it's a Columbia film now. And uh, when 21st Century approached Columbia about the Night of the Dead, there's part of a package deal with Spider-Man. Okay? Now, Columbia's prerequisite for accepting those two films, Spider-Man and Night of the Dead, for 21st century was that Menachem Golem stays 500 miles away <laughs> from wherever the film is, okay? And that's the only way that they would accept doing it. So because of that, we never heard from him, never saw him. I mean, George had to deal with him on a daily basis, or at least Mark Fisher, the producer for 21st century. But uh, in a way, it was a blessing. Because, you know, they'll do a film, somebody will do a film, give it to those guys, Menachem will grab it, destroy it, you know, and then release it. I don't want, you know. So we're lucky that he, they will not have a chance to do that with our film. Yeah. My favorite science fiction film? Okay. Forbidden Planet. Uh, Blade Runner, of course. Um, I have a top ten list. Because people ask me, what's your favorite film? I you know it's impossible. What's your favorite 20 films? Yeah. So uh, I have a top ten list, and most of them begin with B's. Blade Runner, Ben Hur. Uh, huh? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm saying my top ten films, okay? But science fiction wise, Forbidden Planet, um, uh, well, I'm since the late night. We should sit down and talk about this sometime, because it takes thought, there's so many. Normally when somebody asks me, I think about my video, my video shelf at home, I mean, I've got up there, but it's, I got 3,000 videos up there now, and it's like to take ten. But, uh, this on the Earth, Earth versus the Flying Saucers. Mostly, maybe the old ones, I think, and the new thing, um, the old invaders from Mars. I'm sorry, what? Help me out, help me out. What's your favorites? Oh, how can I forget? Yeah, sure, yeah. No. See, but that's, that's what I'm saying. It's so difficult. You've got to really sit down and think there's so many of them. Horror, No, I have that feeling. I have that feeling. It's former. That's why I felt so weird yesterday when, uh, when Howard was out there with his goodies. I don't have any goodies, you know? He said, no, you don't need them anymore. Just call me, just, just bring yourself. Nice. Uh, I really appreciate you guys coming here. It's, uh, I haven't been to a convention in, uh, I guess, about a year or so. And, uh, yeah, I need this. I, you know, you, you tend to need this. You, know, you work uh, essentially alone. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, you, you, it's not like you're on stage performing for somebody. You work in a studio, you work on a location or something, and... Uh, Every now and then somebody says, hey, that was great, or it was a good scene, or you were good today, or blah, 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 blah. But it's not until you come to a place like this where you meet the guys who are the reason why you're doing this. <laughs> so anyway, thanks for, for being here, especially on a Sunday. So, uh, anybody want to know anything? Want to chat about something? Uh, I'm not a former makeup artist, really. If you have any makeup stuff, we can talk about that, too. Yeah. Um, what we talking about Night of Living Dead? Uh, yeah. Question. Um, somebody who wants to get into the field of horror effects makeup, what kind of advice do you have? I wish I had a buck for every time somebody says that. <laughs> you know? Advice? Um, do you do anything or do you do a sculpt or sketch? Or? Uh, not really. Well, um, once you start, you have to photograph absolutely every little thing that you do uh, and get a portfolio started. You know? um, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but if you're standing in a room and you want a job as a makeup artist and you don't have a portfolio, there's a guy sitting over there who's 
a tenth as good as you are, but he's got a portfolio. We're more interested in that guy because he has proof. You know? So it's being in the right place at the right time and being ready. Being ready means having a portfolio. Um, and to learn the stuff, there's only one answer to that question, and that's Dick Smith. As far as I'm concerned, there's Dick Smith's correspondence course. Um, you know who Dick Smith is. He's the greatest makeup artist around. Um, he puts out 20 volumes of information, and it's everything there is to know about special makeup effects, except for what your own imagination injects into it. But the basic skills are there, plus a lot, lot more. Plus a videotape of watching him put on Lincoln's makeup on Hal Holbrook's pages and pages of slides. Plus, uh, since he uh, started the course years ago, he updates it for you for free. Any, any new information he invents or comes across, he'll still send that to you. Your name gets on a, a list. You'll start getting catalogs from companies you never knew existed, from people who make stuff that you never knew they made. It's so helpful to us, you know, as a profession. So it's this course. I give them a call. Uh, it's, it's Larchmont Information, which means just dial 914 And it's Dick Smith on Murray Avenue. Um, but don't tell them I told you that, okay? Because uh, I usually do uh, ask people who call him to say, please tell them that I suggested calling. Because you, know, you get returned favors. You know, Dick hears that, oh, why are you recommending my course? And uh, I, I, I've gotten quite a few letters from Dick, you know, saying, Oh, thanks so much for recommending my course so much. And uh, the last letter I got was, hey, whoa, stop. <laughs> I, there's, it doesn't do me any good now when you do that because there's so many people after it. But uh, call them anyway. Just don't say I call them. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Tom, when you look at a portfolio, um, what is it that you're looking for about style or even different types of, the types of different makeup? What, what is it that really strikes you when you look at a university? It's a good question. I don't really know that until I open it up, and then if it does strike me, then it, it hits a chord, and I know there's something good in there. Uh, but usually it's like a sculpting technique. Uh, if I can see in a, in a clay sculpture that the person uh, has an awareness of anatomy, it's, it's real. You know that when it's cast and the phone piece is made from it, it's on the face, it's going to bend realistically and move for the person's face. If there's a poor texture in it, all the, if it's a finish, if it's a finish thing, you know. All these, tell me, all these things tell me how much a person knows. You know. But if it's good and some of that stuff is gone, then you know that, like I saw one yesterday, and I, I told this guy, you know, you're going to be good in a couple of years. You know. uh, right now it's maybe kind of a primitive, but like, the stuff is there, the basic stuff is there. If I see that they can make molds, and they can um, make foam latex, apply it, uh, some of the edges are not visible, uh, do a nice paint job on it. I guess what I'm saying is that the person can do everything and not specialize in one thing. Because uh, you can ask Howard uh, when you hire somebody, when we hire somebody, normally the budget's so low that you, uh, let's say you, you'd like to hire 15 people, but you're only able to hire six. And every single one of those people have to be able to do everything well. Because you have two people on location, you've got to have three back in the shop that can continue on with, with the job. So I guess that's it. I mean, as someone who, uh, it's pretty well rounded in, in all aspects, especially makeup. Yeah. Uh, I was kind of worried about the Night of the Living Dead remake. Yeah. And I feel like if you tell us who's in it, and also if you personally feel that you've got a better movie than the original. Well, you have to be the judge of that. I mean, you have to tell me whether you think it's the, the better than the original. I, I think it's. Uh, I don't think it's going to disappoint anybody. I think. I think we're counting on the fact that everybody has seen the film and has liked the film, and. But you know, if it was released today, it really wouldn't work, would it? I mean, it's uh, this kind of thing. Uh, crude in some ways, you know. But it's the imagination, I think, that we all latch onto, and the concept of at that time too it was the living dead. That was a, you know, a new, a new thing. We were talking about this yesterday. Maybe the concept is uh, not valid anymore. The dead coming back to life. If so, our only choice was to take that and make it scary. But. Uh, when I see it, you know, uh, part of what I see when I watch it and when I directed it is keeping in mind that, uh, you know, it's a classic before we shoot it. Uh, if we don't do this, it's going to disappoint. For example, uh, there was uh, uh, Johnny, the barber's brother on the way to the cemetery. In the script, he, uh, he didn't come back like he did in the first film, you know. And I thought, well, that's something people are going to look for. We, he has to come back. You know, somehow, George, he has to come back. And George didn't fit toward the barrel. You know, he didn't feel like he should. So I brought him back anyway. You know, so. um, but uh, uh, it's 
McKee here? No? Uh, McKee Anderson plays Helen, the mother in the basement with the daughter, and the daughter is played by a little girl named Heather. Heather walked in, and uh, uh, from her audition, we could tell that she could play any of the female parts. Helen, Judy, Barbara, you know, she was wonderful, so. And a guy named Tony Todd plays Ben. He, he was in Platoon. Uh, if you ever see Platoon again, he's a guy who always had a stick in his hand, a big stick. Uh, he plays back. Um, Tom Cole, the guy who played Otis from Henry, the portrait of a serial killer, he plays Harry. You know, the balding guy in the basement. I cast them pretty much to be similar physical types uh, to the original, except for Barbara, who is played by Patty Coleman. Um, she's a totally uh, different physical type. And, and also, she's a different person in this film. You know, in the original film, Barbara was kind of a, a loony, a wimp for the whole movie, and she hardly ever spoke. In this one, she becomes Sigourney Weaver and alien. Uh, so that's going to be different. Um, is that anything you asked me? Yeah, uh, is it violent? Is that oh, that's Vicki Anderson, the woman who plays Helen. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> if it was violent, I would say it's more violent. Um, the one thing I wanted to do with this film is I wanted to make sure it was impactful. Now, I did it literally. Every time there was an impact, I made sure it was a full impact. Uh, for example, the stunt guys, I'm working out this bit with a crowbar on this guy's head. And uh, the, it, was a, it was a spent crowbar, but it was still kind of, there was a rod in the middle. It was still, if you, if you whacked somebody dead on with full force, it would hurt. So I was trying to work with the actor saying, well, hold, you hold it loose, and if, if the actor looks me right in the eye, he can see exactly when it, the contact is made and to sell it himself, throw his head back. So there's not an impact, it's like a floating thing, and I'm doing that in stunt back, and I said, no, wait, 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 why don't just do it in front of his face and he can act like it and sound sound effect it later? I said, no, no, I want every, so we put powder on his uh, head, and we really whack him with the crowbar, so you see a thud and this powder dust like flies off. The scene where a guy falls off the balcony from two feet, and uh, um, I didn't want to just show him, fall. I wanted to show him hit. You know, always in Westerns, the guy gets shot off the roof, you know, and you can see him fall, we never see him land except for the good, the bad, the ugly, and that guy, you know. So I love that, so I went to tell so we did the dummy of the guy, and made him fall face forward into the, oh shit, I'm getting the fence square. I don't want to do that. Same as for surprises. But anyway, I wanted the impacts all to be felt and to be hard. Because the overall effect of that was you'll get this bombardment, you'll, you'll feel it yourself. I mean, that's why you're there. To identify with somebody, go off on the adventure, and experience the things with them. Uh, we talked yesterday about Dario Argento and his film technique. He takes you, uh, if you've seen opera, and the bullet goes to the keyhole to that person's head, you know. Or uh, uh, there's a raven flying in the opera house, and he does the point of view of the, I don't know how they shot it. But you become the raven, you're flying all through the opera house. I mean, we want to feel that. You know, so anyway, the, the, the point of what I'm saying is I wanted you to feel the impact of the film. And just on those little things, you know, uh, as a director, I made sure that those things happen. Did I? I went off on a tangent, didn't I? You did. Um, I just want to... Uh, I went in the reality. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, um, you know, it's still kind of strange having Joe DeMero looking over your shoulder, kind of? Um, not in the beginning. At the end, it did. Um, it'll be out October 20th. It's a Columbia film. Um, at the beginning, George was uh, not there. George apparently got into a, a creative fight with the producers in Los Angeles. And so every time they didn't send a check or they did something wrong, contractually, things that I wasn't aware of and should not have been aware of, and uh, mostly they did keep me out of it. Whenever they did something like that, he did something in return. He would say, all right, fine, I'm not going to do any publicity for the film which is like a, you know, a scare tactic for them because they desperately need that sort of thing. So he, uh, he was in Florida for whew, all of pre-production, all of the eight weeks of pre-production, uh, writing the dark half, uh, Stephen King's uh, book. And because he's going to direct that screenplay. He wrote the screenplay for the dark half. So luckily that, that decision of his gave him the time to write that. And then when he did come <clears throat> toward the end of pre-production, he saw the whole film that I was going to do on the wall. 700 storyboards. I storyboarded every single sequence in the film. Because I wanted them to see what I was going to do, and if they had any objections, to do it now before we start shooting. And I won't make any mistakes during the shoot. You know, so. so when he came up, he saw some things he didn't like, but he still let me go ahead and do it. He said, I wouldn't do it that way. That's not my taste. This is your movie. You go ahead and do it. And 
And so he was great in that respect, in that he let me do what I wanted to do. Toward the end, however, um, it was a six-week shoot. We weren't over scheduled, but uh, he came around the set often. I'm not saying every day. He came around the set often, and he would start suggesting things. Things that, luckily for me, were very helpful. Um, I was being very economic in the way I was shooting things, because I, I, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew. Uh, the shots I needed to complete the sequence. But then he would suggest things that would make it clear to me that I would, might, might not have to shoot six things to get to one thing, and that was very helpful. Uh, but again, it wasn't bothersome because of, I knew what his attitude was, he knew what he wanted to do, and uh, George has a seasoned eye, 15 films, he can see, and he's a master editor, so he can see three passes on the, in the editing before I can even grasp one, and that respect is very helpful. So I, to answer your question, no. So short answer, or long answer to your short question, no, it did not bother me. Um, although but the problem was, he thought it was. And I guess it's my face. He would come on and think, he would say, you know, I'm afraid to say anything because uh, you, know, you act like you're pissed off on me. I said, no, 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 I'm not that way. No, please, that's not the right attitude. That's not how I feel. And after that, then he would be more, uh, he would be freer with his comments. But sometimes other people would come on who were not supposed to be there, producers who were supposed to be involved in the office and the business end of it, they would come out and make creative suggestions, and I would listen to them. I mean, some stuff I would do, but there's, there's a certain way to deal with those guys. You don't want to ruffle any feathers. But that would bother me, anyway. Enough of that. Yeah, you would be back to your question. Uh, it's been answered. <laughs> that's because I've been talking so much. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. uh, what's your favorite scene from the show? Has your pieces been auctioned off as well, I'm sorry, what? Your, your pieces, have they been auctioned off? Like, uh, we so much money before. Oh, uh, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, but I, I thought that the piece that was auctioned off was mine. I mean, it is mine. Well, Howard sculpted it. Uh, it's from an episode I directed of Tales from the Dark Side. Now, I donated a bunch of stuff to the auction a long time ago, and I thought that this was a last remnant. I was surprised when I saw it being auctioned off. Then there was a guy, is he still here, the guy with the skull mask on? There was a guy sitting there with a skull mask and they told me it was his. He brought it today and gave it to them. He got it in an auction a couple of years ago, I guess, and he gave it to them. Uh, anyway, see, he made a bundle today. But sometimes we do bring rubber stuff, and uh, to us it's stuff that's rejects that we wouldn't use, but uh, to you guys it's a one-of-a-kind deal, which it really is. And if you hang on to it, you know, it could, well, that guy did it. He, he probably bought it for, what, 50 bucks? And he sold it for 300 and some dollars today. You know? so, so if you get something like that, yeah, hang on to it. Uh, but I haven't had stuff auctioned off in a long time. But uh, when I did, yes, I was satisfied with money. Yeah. Uh, well, Hitchcock. Uh, forget it. There's a book out, True Foe on Hitchcock. Did you ever see that? I mean, there's a wealth of information there. Before I directed Night of the Living Dead, I bought there's a book by Edward Dimitri. Uh, uh, about three or four directed books. Hitchcock's another one. Um, and I used to read those things, and every time they said something that was mind-blowing, I would underline it in yellow, okay? Four books. And before I started the film, I went through the books and typed up everything that was written in yellow. You know what I'm saying? And I would read that daily. That was like a primer. That was like to get you going. You know? But Hitchcock, uh, um, and watching films like, well, E.T., we talked about this before. If you ever see E.T. again, notice that almost every shot is shot from about this high camera is usually this high. And that's how tall you are when you're about 12 years old. If you think about it, it was pretty brilliant for Spielberg to do that because, you know, like a third way in the movie, you're suddenly that tall watching the whole movie. You're one of the kids. And he teased your pal and he really sucked you in and you became, I think it helped the impact of it or how much you enjoyed it. But that's something you don't learn anywhere in directing school. That's, you know, you can invent that. <coughs> so things like that that I would pick up from the films, uh, the directors, uh, were really helpful. But, uh, it also depends on the project. I mean, when you read a script, you can't say, well, how would Hitchcock do this? You can't say that. You should not say that. To, to copy somebody makes you second rate. I mean, you know, you have to be original. And that's the only thing that you have to offer anybody else that's unique, and that's yourself. Because you are unique compared to everybody else. I mean, you are an individual. So the point is, um, you read a script and see how it smacks you, and go with that. You know, And sometimes you'll think, well, hey, Hitchcock did something similar to that, but I don't think you ever copied. But, I mean, I'm sure that I copied somebody, you know, verbatim with some shots. I know I copied Dario uh, when we did Evil Line. I learned a lot from Dario Argento. Um, he thinks of something and does not think of its limitations. 
well, shit, the top people can't deal with that. Or uh, it would take nine days to shoot this, you know. He thought it, he wants it, he goes after it, and he makes sure he gets it. And that's the correct attitude, right? Yeah. You know, I, I asked George before we started, I said, you know, you know please uh, try when you're negotiating with the 21st century uh, to at least get the power to release the video I'm rated. Because we don't have any power with the MPAA yet. It's, you know, they cut it, you've got to go along with it. You can argue, you can appeal, you know. But that's what usually happens with the after releases, the unrated, or not the, the <coughs> rated ones, they have to cut so much out. So why not go for a video release that's unrated, you know? And I, he did say there are some particular problems with trying to do that business-wise. I don't recall what they are, but uh, just to foresee the possibility that they would cut it so bad, and I don't know what the status of that is yet, but uh, uh, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah. But I, I hope that we're able to, if they cut it, to release a version that's totally uncut. Yeah, I got Dario Argento called from Italy. He wants me to direct uh, an Edgar Allan Poe thing, Italy form. It's an anthology. There's two episodes. One's Telltale Heart, and uh, I forget what the other one is. But it'll be, I'm sure it'll be a modern updated. No, it's a period, period piece. To me, that's a dream come true. I've never been to Italy. I'm Italian. You know, I might look up my dad's or something. Uh, I'm anxious to do that. Plus, uh, John Esposito, the guy that wrote Graveyard Shift, that they're currently shooting, uh, he has a, uh, he's paramount, seems to love him and his scripts. And, uh, I owned a thing from, by him called Telltale Tavern for uh, about a year and a half. Um, I lost, I was right. I didn't pay for it. It was just a favorite to him. He said it's mine forever, but he's pushing me to direct that and it'll be for Paramount. So well, we talked yesterday that it's a good idea to get another directing job before your first film comes out. Because if it fails, you'll never get another job. <laughs> but if I get another job now, fine, that feels well, here's another one, guys. Here, what's this one like? You like this one? Yeah. So that's what I hope will happen. Yes. When you go to cast your movie, do you go from more lesser-known actors than the big stars? Well, this movie I wanted to. I definitely wanted to use Unknowns uh, because the first film did that. But uh, I don't want to say Tony Todd is an unknown or anybody else is an unknown. Um, strictly because, you know, uh, Tom Tolles was in Henry the Port of the, of the Shooting Film. I was actually going for Steve James and, uh, and Michael Ironside to begin with. Um, but I think their faces are unknown enough that it'll still work. You wouldn't be, uh, you know, sometimes you see a movie and uh, uh, an actor that you're so familiar with pops on the screen and you gotta get your, 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 uh, your his connotation out of your mind before you can get into it. Like last night we watched <coughs> Die Hard and John Ambrose came on the screen and uh, I just worked with him on Evil Eyes. So now that I know him, it kind of was a little, uh, I mean, you forget about it and you get into the movie, you know. But uh, for the Night of the Dead purposes, yes, I did want to go with my notes. Um, and that's the only one I've done so far. You know, as far as movie goes, so yeah, I know, yeah. I think uh, Fangoria Magazine made me popular. <laughs> Tony, you still here? Ah, too bad. Um, no, it's true. I mean, I, you know, you like to be popular. Uh, uh, my name got out. My name got associated with the Splatter movies. I was the King of Splatter all the time. King of Gore. I'm still reading that on T-shirts. King of Gore. You know. But I'm glad I'd rather my name get out at something as opposed to my name never getting out. But with all of all the pictures and fango and all the publicity and guys calling me to write a book and I use some of your work in a chapter, you know, it gets sort of made a Letterman show, it's on a Letterman show five times. That all helps, you know. So I don't think it's something you can plan. I mean, certainly there are people that plan a career like that. If I was in LA, I'd be out there trying to do it. But I'm from Pittsburgh, you know. I'm lucky. I don't have to live in New York or Hollywood. They call me, I go where they are. So I'm kind of proud of the fact that I never left my hometown. Um, yet I'm out there. I'm out there in the, you know, in the genre. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. No. Well, in school, sure. I went to. No, there isn't. There is. There's no place you can go to learn this stuff unless you teach teach yourself, like we all did, or uh, take Dick Smith's correspondence course. I wish we had his course when we were growing up. Um, there's an ad in the back of Fango, actually, for it. Uh, I was telling you about 914, but I just remember there is an ad. Is there still an ad for the Dick Smith School? So, yeah. Now, he, he likes to know that you're already doing stuff, so you, sh you should be prepared with some polaroids of the work, you know, so he at least can see that you're into it. 
Uh, yeah. Uh, I saw you in uh, Pittsburgh in, I think it was 1979, you told a story about the time you made up a body and the uh, I think you were the coroner or something. Oh, yeah. Like that. Yeah, that's in my book. Uh, in fact, it's real small print in the book. It, uh, uh, I did a, I did a, for Dawn of the Dead, I, I took a medical skeleton that I borrowed from a costume company, made it up to look like a corpse. And when the movie was over, I gave it back to the costume company. For Halloween one year, they put it in the front of their window in a coffin, and a policeman came by to rent a costume or something. And he saw the body, and it, it looked pretty real to him, so he called the county coroner in, you know, and they arrested the lady, closed her shop down. <laughs> yeah. And so here's a, and this was a newly elected county coroner, so here's a guy who couldn't tell the difference between real rotted flesh and Rice Krispies and latex. <laughs> so it was really embarrassing. I mean, it was really embarrassing for him. And I, I don't know if that cop is still a cop or not. But then it was a big, and I called him and said, wait, that's mine. You know, I said, it's a medical, look at the fingers, there's springs in there. You know, we don't, we don't die with springs in our jaw. <laughs> yeah, well, it was a medical skeleton that we decorated. Oh, you know. But to this day, that poor lady, uh, the costume, uh, they still made her either cremate the thing or bury it. Because as far as they were concerned, it was a dead body in the city of Pittsburgh. And even though I told them, if you look at my book, there's a picture of it and the, the, the actual newspaper article. Um, so that was you know, an episode. Yeah. Tom, um, speaking of brand illusions, I read somewhere that um, you were going to write a, a volume two of it, and it was going to cover your work from after pre show right on up to the present. Yeah. Did that ever get off the ground? Oh yeah, it's how how high up off the ground is another <laughs> matter. Uh, I did write three or four chapters and sent, you know, gave it to the publishers. But it's got so busy, I just didn't have time to write anymore. But it's going to be twice as thick when it does eventually come out. And we talked yesterday uh, if. Uh, if, uh, if the film does well and I get my percentage and the money starts coming in, I'll just finance it myself because I really love having a document of uh, my work. And if I'm not going to do effects anymore, then the last film I did as an effects artist, it will, be, you know, it will all be documented in my books and you know, my daughter can see when she grows up. But I really love the idea of having something like that, so I will do it whether I finance it myself or not. Yeah? Uh, do you think you will do effects? Or yeah, I mean, I'm still, I'm still president of my company, and my company, aside from now directing and putting me out as an actor or a fight director, I still have a special effects. I mean, the company still does special makeup effects. Well, will you be doing it yourself, personally? Well, directing um, well, the last couple of films I've done, I did get my hands in the clay every now and then, but I was more of a, of a supervisor, you know? I'm more of a broker who hired the talent. They came in, they worked in my workshop. I would supervise everything on the way to its final end. Supervise, invent the gags, you know? But maybe everyone else did the work. Because I, I was heading toward what I'm doing now, directing. And that was a way of doing it, make sure. Because when I directed Night of Living Dead, you know, I wasn't doing any effects. But uh, I, you know, I supervised and designed some of it, and they came up with stuff that was incredible. And by my attitude in the last couple of films leading to, you know, it paid off because now I am in a position where I can't worry about it. It's another department who has to deliver for the film. But there may, I mean, there may be, I mean, there's so many movies coming through Pittsburgh. I may do one where it's just an appliance or stuff, or I actually will do it in the plan. I don't think I'll, I'll ever stop because it is my main love. I mean, even when I was a kid, no matter what I was involved with, I always had a makeup kit up in the attic collecting dust. And every now and then I'd pull it out and, and play with it, and eventually it became my life. Anybody, I think it's somebody new. I'll get you this, yes. I'll get you this second. Um, no, like, you, know, you can't really say that one technique or another is somebody else's. Uh, if there was something similar, yeah, I was aiming for something that was kind of similar to what I saw him do in opera. Um, there was a scene in the script where, you know, the, the zombies are crashing in toward the end, the is wounded, he's got a gun, and I wanted to do a scene where... Uh, as the zombies attack and Ben is so weak, all he can manage to do is get the gun up into the zombie's face and he eventually, and there's one round, but no, there's two rounds in the gun. And I want to do a really macro close-up of the barrel of the gun to show that there's no rounds toward the hammer, but they were clicking toward it, you know, like one at a time. When the zombie's fighting, maybe he'd go toward the zombie's face and keep on fighting. Do the same thing maybe twice, you know, like toward the eye, and then the eye's expecting, you know, but then another clip. But to show those rounds getting closer to the hammer, and eventually get the gun in the zombie's mouth, okay, 
Now the bullets are getting closer to the hammer, okay? And then more struggle, of course. And this would happen while other things are going on. You're cutting back and forth. And the suspense is in everything you're cutting to. Barbers at the door, zombies are coming. Um, Harry's like struggling, shooting, trying to get down to the basement, you know? This gun's going off. And have three things happening at the same time that each one was suspenseful enough that you wanted something to end or something to resolve, you know? So anyway, finally with a gun in the zombie's mouth and the, the bullet is just clicking in front of the hammer, you would expect the back of the guy's head to blow off, you know? But then, but thinking of ratings again, I was gonna have the effects guys build a frame about this big uh, of the inside of someone's head with a hole, like a tunnel, like three-dimensional. And I was gonna, uh, when, the, when, the, when the hammer, when the bullet finally got in front of the hammer and it fired, you would see a flash and you would travel right through this bloody mess, through the hole, to Barbara, who gets blood splashed on her from the guy's head. See? So I hear something that was not was not somebody's brains being blown out. It was simply traveling through a tunnel, you know, and seeing blood splash on somebody. What the rating board couldn't possibly cut it. But it was you traveling with the blood. You know what I'm saying? It's a mood thing. You know, it's, a, it's an emotional thing. I never got to do it, <laughs> but uh, that's something that was planned. It's in the storyboards, and that was, uh, it came from. Argento-like shots that I've seen. Can you go for a similar camera? Oh yeah, I, in fact, I insisted on having a polo cam. A polo cam is a handheld, steady thing that you can run around with. Because we couldn't afford to have a steady cam for the whole shoot. Um, in Night of the Living Dead, there's a lot of handheld shots. And it made it look like a documentary kind of thing. I wanted that kind of a feel, but I wanted it smoother so it wouldn't be so, un so bulky and uncomfortable. And the polo cam gave us that. So yeah, I do like smooth. I like the camera to be constantly moving, and I hope it is. I'm sure there are some stagnant conversation things, but uh, for the most part, the camera moves a lot into this move. Somebody over here, uh, yeah. Uh, how long does Leno do Leno? Do you ever think that Leno decided to do it back? He's always making a try with that. <laughs> uh, but see, you know what? That's it's part of the show that he has to put on. Uh, you don't, you do not meet him before you go on the air. I mean, before they tape it. And taping essentially is being on the air. You, don't, you do not meet him. The fifth time I was on his show was the first time that he wanted me to do what I was going to do to him on the show to somebody else first, okay? Because it was a head hit, and he really it bothered him a lot. I mean, every other time I was, I was on four times before that, you know, we would do on the chest and scripts, you know, on other things. Um, he didn't care to meet the person. So we did it on a crew member, we blasted it, and the, the guy, the only complaint he had was, was very loud, you know, so, well, we'll we told Letterman that we would put earplugs in and then he was fine. But on the show, uh, on the air, when we did it, he did not wear the earplugs. And he didn't seem to react to the loudness. But um, I realized that he's putting on a show when once uh, the, the mask that was auctioned off the butch thing, um, I had the full head on the show and I tried it on him. I put it on his head, you know, as part of the show. And as I was taking it off, he was, uh, he, was, he, was, he was acting like he was having difficulty taking it off. And he was saying, oh, fine, tear some more of my ear off, Tom. I looked him right in the eye, and the thing was nowhere near his ear, and he did not mean it in his eye, but I realized that, wait, right, he's only putting on a show. He has to do this. He, he needs to do this, you know? So uh, whenever you see somebody else on his show, he's giving him a hard time. Realize he's, he's putting on a show for you, you know? It's not, you know? But I mean, when Kmart is on, the magician, I feel sorry for those guys, or uh, the lady who comes on with the natural foods, I mean, he really gives them a hard time. But I think. All the hard time he gave me, we kind of uh, had a kind of a, a thing going where only once I think that he made me like a real asshole, but aside from that, <laughs> <laughs> huh? yeah, well, that was an accident, but it was really, I should have been uh, careful about that. But on the fifth time, I burned his hand again, and it was fine. And in fact, we even said, okay, am I redeemed now? And he said, yes. I feel redeemed. Yes. Oh, no. Oh, I'm just scratching your head? Okay. Yeah. Do I hope he is going to go into special effects? I think she hope he is, you know. Uh, I have so many pictures of her, like I'm sculpting something, and she's sitting right on my lap sculpting her own little thing, you know. Uh, she's constantly drawing. If she were here, she'd be walking around asking you if you want her autograph. <laughs> <laughs> and she's a little obnoxious, right? 